Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining another one of these remote Roads to Research sessions. Uh, before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge that um, on behalf of RU's Office of Research Services, um, Royal Roads University is located on the ancestral lands of the Kosansan and Lekwungen families. And today I'm speaking from Lekwungen traditional territory. And I invite everyone who's listening to take a moment to think about the land on which you're living and working and acknowledge that land and the original people of that territory. Today, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Richard Kuhl, who's professor in RU School of Environment and Sustainability. He's also the founder of the MA in Environmental Education and Communications. His presentation, Do We Live Like We Live on an Island? Planning, Governance, and the Problem of Sustainability on Vancouver Island. Um, we're delighted that he could make the time for this presentation. It was originally postponed, um, and it seems very timely now. Um, just a note to say that the presentation is being recorded, so I've muted everybody's audio and video, but we may um, open that up again later, or you can use the chat as people have already started doing. And um, finally, I'd like to thank uh, the Canadian Tri-Agency Research Support Fund for their support of these events. Over to you, Rick. Thank you. Okay. I'll see about <laughs> if I can share my slides. There we go. So first, I'd like to thank Vanessa and all of the people working in the Office of Research. You, you know, if you've been at Royal Roads long, even for a little while, you know that we have many groups of gems at Royal Roads in the Office of Research has always from, as long as I've been at the university, been one of those little groups of, of caring, supportive, committed folks. And so I, I really appreciate Vanessa and, and all the folks there. So this project actually started a few years ago uh, and uh, it's now coming out in a, a book that UBC Press is, is gonna be publishing that looks at Vancouver Island and the archipelago of islands that we're part of in the Salish Sea. Um, so I'm going to talk about sustainability and unsustainability. Um, you know, I'm going to present uh, kind of models of where things are and where things might go in the future. But, you know, we're not alone in worrying about whether the sky would fall. I'm really interested in talking about Vancouver Island as an island. Just a few weeks ago, this came out in the, the Times Colonist. And it talked about us as Vancouver Islanders. Why can't Vancouver Island do the same as New Zealand is doing or Australia is doing? And in a sense, my argument will be through this is that we don't think of ourselves as Vancouver Islanders. We don't behave as if we are. Now, I want to be really clear at the outset, I'm not talking about the Vancouver Island party. There is a political party called this. Um, uh, citizens of Vancouver Island unite. Well, no, that's not what I'm talking about. And I'm also not really going to be talking about First Nations other than one other slide. I, I'm not sure whether the, the many First Nations uh, living all around the edges of Vancouver Island ever had a sense of the islandness of where they lived. Um, you know, when they lived out on, uh, you know, Mears Island and Tofino, they were clearly aware of the island they were living on. But um, so I'm not going to be talking about First Nations. I'm talking about Vancouver Island really as a potentially as a political entity. You know, in, before there was British Columbia um, as a political entity, there was Vancouver Island as a political entity. It, it, it came into existence as a political entity in 1849 when a royal charter was given to the Hudson's Bay Company to the colony of British subjects in sell the land at a reasonable price. In some ways, that's the start of Vancouver Island as an island, as a polity. Vancouver Island had a flag. Vancouver Island had a great seal. It's in the archives at the museum. There was a legislative council of Vancouver Island, all men, of course, but there was an island council, legislative council, and there were governors of, of Vancouver Island, Richard Blanchard, of course, the Blanchard Building, Ministry of Health, James Douglas in the Douglas Street, Arthur Kennedy, Kennedy Lake out in the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, and the from 1849 until 1866, there was a Vancouver Island. Um, they had financial problems. 
Um, there were all sorts of issues going on. And by 1866, Vancouver Island as a political entity disappeared. Um, Vancouver Island was really shotgunned into uh, British Columbia and, um, and that was the end of Vancouver Island as a place. So that word I keep on saying is island. So what's an island? You know, you have, we know, you know, we know we live on an island, but an island really in, you know, as a biologist might think of it, is a place of favorable habitat surrounded by a sea of, of less favorable habitat. So the little pond that lives inside a, um, a bromeliad, uh, a, a, little, a little bromeliad like this little pond here, is the world. It's an island of favorable habitat for all sorts of critters, some of which you can see and a whole bunch that I used to study, you can't see. You know, our, our friend, our Vancouver Island marmot, they live on mountaintops, islands, and they're surrounded by a sea of places they just can't live. They, they get killed, they don't have the right food, mountaintops of their islands. Whales die in the ocean. When the whales die, they fall down and they become islands of energy sources in the deep sea for a whole range of creatures that can't really successfully live anyplace else. So we live on an island island, this, this space of favorable habitat surrounded by water, surrounded by a place that we really can't live. We go there, but we can't live on. Now, the great economist Kenneth Boulding, you know, wrote this very prescient paper in 66, you know, the economics of the coming spaceship Earth. He began to point out that the Earth is really an island. The Earth is like a spaceship, which is clearly an island in the middle of of space. And he contrasted the, the um, thinking of a cowboy and a cowboy economy, which is to use up stuff as fast as you can and move on with that of a spaceman economy, which is concerned about taking care of what you have, not using it up and endlessly growing. Well, islands are like spaceships. We're bounded and we have we have a, we're surrounded by a sea of unfavorable stuff. Now, when you take this thinking further, you end up with thinking like the best-selling environmental book of all time, the book from 1972, Limits to Growth. Clearly living on a spaceship, you don't, you, you don't want to end, endlessly grow on that spaceship. There are limits to growth. And we know from the early 70s when this book was published that growth on our, in our global society is problematic. And from the early 1970s, we've had graphs like, like this that basically say that things can't go on endlessly grow other than maybe the human imagination and spirit. So islands, I think, have to consider issues of limits. Issues of boundaries, the work of Will Steffen and some of these other folks published in this case in science are trying to identify planetary boundaries, thinking as if the Earth also is an island and there are limits and boundaries. And uh, this work from the Stockholm Sustainability Institute is brilliant and it should be directing a lot of what we think about. Well, islands have edges and islands need to understand that there are boundaries, edges, and, and there are limits. That we need to be much more aware, I, I'm going to argue, on, the, on those boundaries of the place in which we live and on what we can do within those, within those limits. Vancouver Island is a big place. And if, if it were an island or a country on our own, you can see we're big. We're 10th largest island 10th largest island if we were an island state in, in the world. So we're significant in, in many ways. But right now, there is no political entity called Vancouver Island. And, um, and that's the issue that I'm going to be addressing. Because in as much as there is no political Vancouver Island, we, I, I'm going to argue, really aren't living like we live on an island with an understanding of limits. So again, this story from the Times Colonist, 
why can't Vancouver Islanders do what the New Zealanders have done, do what the Australians have done? Well, in part because we have no island governance, we have no ability to, uh, to uh, have, a, have governance. There is no minister associated with Vancouver Island, no mayor associated with Vancouver Island. There's no voice for Vancouver Island, and there's no venue for island decision making. And as I'll reiterate later, problems need to be addressed at the scale that's appropriate to solving their problems. And I don't think we have the ability to do that on Vancouver Island. We're a ge geographic island, but nowhere else are we really an island. When you look at, at how governments see us, well, there is no political Vancouver Island. When you look at, um, this is a, um, island health up here. It spills over onto the adjacent northern mainland. Um, Ministry of Environment, I think it's this this map here. Vancouver Island, you know, we can't, we, we're, we're lumped in with the with Haida Gwaii. Uh, federal government ministries also, you know, there's no, there's nothing that focuses. It's even hard to get statistics for Vancouver Island because we're lumped in with other places. What do we have on Vancouver Island? Well, we have seven regional districts, which really somewhat tenaciously guard their turf. Uh, of course, the CRD, Capital Regional District, is the largest one uh, po uh, population-wise. We have 37 municipal governments, and they don't all see the world in the same way. We have 50 or 53 First Nations communities with varying degrees of self-governance, uh, from the Salish down the here, and the Chalmers on the West Coast, and the Kwagyu on the east northeast side of Vancouver Island. But there is no governance. There is no island governance. There is no island minister. There's no where we're this hodgepodge of, of political jurisdictions, none of which particularly play well with each other and end up with no way for us to make sense of dealing with island wide sustainability issues. But the other problem to me is that I think we delude ourselves because we really think we're green and sustainable. You know, we've got electric vehicles. We're all, I mean, I am a bike commuter, we, you know, James Bader Royal Roads. Um, we like to think of ourselves as green and sustainable. You know, we buy silver oil corn, the best corn in the world. Uh, we have all the healthy organic farms on the island. You know, we have seafood, the prawn shrimps, the uh, spotted shrimps, and our wonderful, e our eco village uh, um, up there in Shawnigan Lake. We'd like to think we're green and sustainable here on Vancouver Island. We'd like to think we're different, and politically we seem to be different. If you look at the, the elections over the last uh, two uh, federal cycles, you know, I mean, here's the Green Party vote in Canada. Here's the Green Party vote last time on Vancouver Island. And here's the Green Party vote last time again on Vancouver Island. We don't look like anywhere else in Canada politically. We elected the first Green MP, first Green MLA. Um, but are we as green and sustainable as we'd like to think of ourselves as being? And I'm going to demonstrate, I hope that, no, we're not. So right now, Vancouver Island more or less has, you know, less than 900,000 people on it. And the first little simple-minded analysis I'd like to offer is that of the ecological footprint. Ecological footprint is a relatively straightforward concept that tries to measure how much land we use um, to live our lives, land that we use to... Um, land that's needed to produce the paper and wood products we use per year, land that's needed to suck up the carbon we generate per year, land that's used to uh, be grazed by, uh, by cattle, for example, the land that's needed to grow our green crops. Uh, they've recently added the idea of fishing and our, and our urban environment. How much land do each of us take? And it's land that can be used for nothing else by anyone else if we're using it. Well, when you look at the ecological footprint of Vancouver Island, you have to know how many people there are, you have to know how much each person uses and how much land is available. Vancouver Island, 31,000 square kilometers, and a big hunk of that is alpine and subalpine meadows. It's not particularly land that's bioavailable for things like sucking up carbon out of the atmosphere because there's no trees up in the alpine and not much rapid growth in the subalpine. And you can't grow food up there. 
So 31,000 km square kilometers, we'll take that as a start. Each Canadian appropriates about seven hectares or seven sports field areas a year. That's what that's the land that we use, you know, to provide the cotton for my shirt and the carbon for, you know, the, the car that I drive on occasion and the airplanes I get on. Seven hectares is what our ecological footprint is. So the ecological footprint, if you multiply it by the almost 900,000 people, the ecological footprint of the island is about twice the island area. So in that sense, we're living far beyond our means were we to have to be bounded by living on Vancouver Island. And we know, you know, this trade, trade helps to, you know, we buy land from other people in a sense to make up this very large ecological footprint we have, a footprint that far exceeds the ability of Vancouver Island to provide. And we can look at agriculture because we like to think we're all local eating and, you know, people are buying, you know, the farmer's market stuff. The uh, agricultural land reserve was set up in 1974 by the first NDP government under David Barrett. Um, between the 50s and the 70s, a, a good amount of the island's prime agricultural land was removed for, for production. A lot of it was done here in Saanich. You may be living out in what was prime agricultural land. Since the ALR was uh, created, uh, another hundred square kilometers. That's a lot. That's that's a lot of area, kilometer by kilometer, or hundreds of them, have been removed. Right now, the ALR on Vancouver Island has about a thousand square kilometers of that thirty-one thousand square kilometers. But if we look at our food footprint, and the food footprint is about one and a half hectares per year of uh, per each person. We'd need more than 13,000 square kilometers if we were going to feed ourselves on Vancouver Island. Well, it's, that's a pretty enormous figure compared to given how much land is available on Vancouver Island, more than a magnitude, order of magnitude, more than what we have in the present one. And even if you, you know, we could start trying to convert woodlands to farmlands or utilize people's backyards or urban parks, and we could maybe increase our amount of food, and yet still nowhere to being anywhere close to self-sufficient on Vancouver Island. And then you have to ask, well, what about all the creatures that live in the, the woodlands that would uh, now have no more place to live? I had uh, our Bachelor of Science students for a few years ago do a project on creating um, signage like this for for bus stops that would try to communicate to the people of Vancouver Island what's really going on with our food. Um, now clearly this picture is not Vancouver Island but you get the idea. The point is that we utilize very little of the Vancouver, we, we may, we the, the food grown on Vancouver Island provides very little of our total food needs. And uh, the fact in 2006, they were estimating that we spend, you know, um, five billion dollars uh, on food that leaves Vancouver Island is an indication of how unsustainable our, our food supply is on Vancouver Island. Well, we have water resources and, and no one's talking about this. We, um, in the sense of an island's perspective on uh, on food and food security, we have a range of water resources, water systems, water districts all over the island um, that are all, in a sense, on their own. They're regulated by island health, but they're all on their own. And we have no island way of considering water. So we have things like this, the Cowichan River gets into trouble. Salt Spring gets into trouble, Tofino gets into trouble, BC Hydro can, you know, a year ago saying winter drought has caused water supplies, uh, concerns. We have no way of talking about water on Vancouver Island because there is no political Vancouver Island. Vancouver Island is tethered to the mainland through tethers that we almost never see. You know, and, and uh, we, the main tether, of course, is BC Hydro. Now, pretty astonished when I saw 22 million passengers. I know we all have aunts who want to visit us here, but 22 million passengers a year, that's a lot of aunts coming over. I was impressed that they're saying they take seven to eight billion dollars of cargo 
this is recently in 2006 the, the data i had indicated that was five billion dollars of food most of what seems to be coming back and forth on the on the ferries is food and it's invisible to us and when it's invisible we don't see it and then we don't think about it but this is a tether that ties us to the mainland necessarily but we have other tethers that are even more invisible. For example, there we have we have no hydrocarbons at all on Vancouver Island that we produce now. We used to mine coal, but that's that's the end of it. Now, uh, just near Ladysmith, Fortis has a natural gas facility. None of you may have ever seen it, and may not even be aware of it. It has enough gas to keep thirty thousand folks warm for forty five days. The, there's a crossing that comes across from um, around from Powell River. There it is. And then that's piped, the natural gas is piped down to the plant here by, by um, Ladysmith, Nanaimo. Now, that's one pipe we have. It's not very big. You know, a sm underwater landslide could, could wreck our whole day here on Vancouver Island in terms of um, natural gas, but we just don't see it, right? We have a whole bunch of dams. There's quite a number of, of hydro dams on Vancouver Island, yet we use much more electricity than we make. Um, and it was not even easy to, to figure this out, to figure out the numbers about how much could the dams produce and how much do we use. Uh, and this was just residential electricity usage. I, I have no ideas about uh, industrial usage. But most of our electricity comes from the mainland. There's a couple of high voltage cables that go underwater. You see it as you drive to the ferry in Sawasan. The cables go underground there. They cross over onto uh, Galliano Island, I think it is, and then from there across up by, up by Duncan. Right now we, we utilize, we make about a third of the electricity that we need on Vancouver Island, something like that. Um, but it's invisible. We don't see the tethers. There's other things. Um, I had uh, took a lot of poking around to figure out where's our gasoline come from, right? We we use six and six and a half million liters of liquid fuel a day on Vancouver Island. Almost every day, a shipping movement brings liquid fuel to the island, and it's invisible to us. We don't see it. We don't think about it. But it's all coming on. It's, we're tethered to the mainland. So given these realities, I began looking at regional districts and municipal governments, but mainly regional districts, to see how did how do these regional districts on Vancouver Island address the fact that we live on an island? And I can tell you it was shocking because I looked at every official community plan, every growth energy management strategy, every regional growth strategy from the CRD here across the province, across the island. And essentially what I found was Virtually none of them even have a nod to the idea that their communities are on islands in the Pacific. We could have been talking about swift currents, Saskatchewan, in these documents, and it would have made just as much sense. Um, I'll give you a few examples of where, um, where an island showed up. The first was a map in the Nanaimo Regional District's uh, regional growth strategy, um, where at least they show here Nanaimo is part of an island. But there was really nothing else in the document to mention that we live on an island. Comox Valley um, uh, had had one little thing. So I wrote here, uh, you know, 37 municipalities and seven regional districts, and I found three examples of of thinking about that we live on an island. So in the, the Comox Valley strategy, talked about. Um, you know, the, reduce the dependence of importing food to the island. And they talked about food resilience. In the same way, the CRD, uh, uh, a draft that came out and uh, talks about the, um, you know, living on an island increases travel costs and land availability. But there was precious little. Uh, sustainable sandwiches plan talked about uh, challenges that include the geographic constraints of an island location, but none of them talked talk meaningfully about what those constraints are and what they were going to do in that context. For example, the regional growth strategy here talked about they wanted to increase the amount of land and crop production for food by 5,000 hectares. 
to enhance local food security. Well, if my math is right, and I always worry about my math, um, that 5,000 hectares converts to 50 square kilometers. And um, that's a size half the area of Saanich, right? I don't know where they're going to find this land. I found that the term electricity doesn't show up in any of the planning documents. No one talked, none of the documents talk about gasoline or natural gas. The Comox Valley people talk about, they want to decrease the amount of energy we use, but they don't really say anything in, the, in these sustainability documents about how they're going to do that. They don't talk about wastes. This is the Heartland Road uh, landfill out in, in the peninsula. We're not dealing with waste on Vancouver Island in any coherent way. There's no, no way to do it coherently. That our recent report indicated that all regional districts, all seven regional districts are having problems and that uh, planning to export waste to the US is not without risk. Meanwhile, the, Cap the Cowichan Valley Regional District, and I'm sure any of you who live there know this, that, that all the waste from the uh, CVRD is bundled, put into boats, and sent across to Washington State because we haven't figured out a way as an island to deal with waste. None of the, none of the regional districts talked about population growth. Um, and it's kind of a classic old cartoon from The New Yorker. The, in, when they do talk about population in any of the documents that I reviewed, they talk about the population growth as just being something that's going to happen like the weather. You know, that, that the population, is, these are quotes, you know, population is forecast to, population expected to, it's just like we talk about the weather. There's no sense that we live on an island where that could be a problem. Um, the chartered professional accountants of British Columbia say that population growth strengthens our island economy, but few of the documents mentioned where waste would go. Some talked about compact urban areas and way to reduce suburban sprawl, but none of them talked about the ecological footprint of the island. Uh, none of them talked about the environmental impact of increased population or where food and energy is going to come from. Just wasn't part of any of the discussion. Are we as green and sustainable as we like to think we are? I'd say, no, we're not. Um, we have a long ways to go. So to wrap this, this up, um, just like to ask or you know, present some ideas on where we might, we might go with all of this. First, I think we have a problem of governance on Vancouver Island. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's an NDP or liberal government in Victoria. The island has a problem of governance because governance um, relating to problems need to be commit the scale of the problem. So just as we think having a made in Alberta solution to climate change sounds kind of silly, we don't have any Vancouver Island, we can't, it can't be a made in Langford solution to the problems of um, waste and garbage on Vancouver Island or water on Vancouver Island or energy on Vancouver Island. Not all, climate change isn't an island scale problem that we can, we're going to have to be involved with much larger uh, levels of governance to deal with, with climate change issues. But in the absence of an island scale governance, there are whole bunches of problems which can't be addressed locally and have to be dealt with or should be dealt with at an island scale, I'd argue. And so our fragmentation, fragmentary political boundaries and fragmentary, fragmented governance processes, I don't think provide meaningful context for consideration of island sustainability concerns. That's my point. I was going to be presenting this last month to the um, Association of Vancouver Island and Coastal Communities Conference, but the conference was canceled. And because what I think has to happen is these mayors and councillors and civic leaders have to begin to think about the fact that their communities are on an island. And, and we, I think, make ourselves more sub, more at risk to, uh, to major disruption uh, as, uh, as we fail to consider the fact that we live on an island. And we don't include island nests in our planning or in our thinking. So 
what do we have to do, I, I think? I think we have to be willing to confront what is. And that's what I had those undergraduate students do, to look at what is the situation? You know, mo no one knows that we use six and a half li million liters of gasoline every day on Vancouver Island. It's just, it's invisible. So we have to reveal things that right now are hidden. I think that's one of the major jobs of any educator. Uh, and all of us as adults are educators. But one of our tasks is to reveal things that are hidden. And we need to be able to find a vehicle for talking to Vancouver Island Islanders about the fact that we live on an island. And this is what is. Right now, too much is hidden from view. We fail to realize we live on an island that is connected to a mainland source through these fragile and potentially tentative tethers. And that we live in a place where the ecological footprint far exceeds the island's ability to provide for us. Because if we can consider what is honestly revealing the things that are now hidden to us and, and looking at them clearly, then we as a, as a larger community on Vancouver Island and in smaller regional places on the island could begin to imagine a, a possible future that is more in line with um, a sustainable way of operating. Right, that, that looks at where's our energy coming from, it looks at where our water is, it looks at how do we collaborate on dealing with the waste that we produce. Um, we can then begin to imagine what could be, and this could be done all across the island. But there's many things that could be, but we also need to come to what should be, which is a values question, a moral question almost. Um, there's many possibilities, but not all of them are things that should be enacted. And I think, again, as a, as a polity, our leaders could be engaging in these kinds of discussions of what could be and what should be. And then finally, to look at what will be. That is, what will we make happen in as much as whatever the will be is, is within our control. And. Uh, this is a, a project that I've been I've been playing with and 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 working on because I think I think this is something that would be of value really in any place, but especially I think on an island. I think that we've really got to work with Vancouver Island municipal leadership, and I've been um, working with the uh, um, mayor of Saanich, and he uh, and uh, and Mayor Helps in Victoria have really been interested and unfortunately the, the COVID thing has really, you know, sidelined a lot of thinking about these larger problems uh, because there are many, many very immediate problems that have to be addressed. But um, I think this is what we have to do. And I think we also have to be aware that it isn't easy. And I know that. But finally, if we can't recognize that we live on an island and we have to think about the, the limits of the island, the limits to growth, the limits of material throughput on this island, are we ever going to be able to figure out how to live on the planet? Because the planet, too, is an island. So thank you, Vanessa, for organizing this and giving me the chance to run quickly through uh, my, my presentation. Um, I guess we can unmute people and if um, I don't know, Vanessa, are you do you moderate this or Hi, thanks, Rick. That was great. Yeah, I've um, allowed participants to share their audio and video. If they have any questions, they could uh, do it that way or we could take them in the chat. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll open so, the chat. OK, thank you again. That was really, really interesting. <laughs> Gave me a lot to think about. Well, you know, we, 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 we live, we live in this beautiful place and, um, and it's very easy to forget that it's an island and that everything, almost everything we get here comes from someplace else. Mm -hmm. And in terms of food sustainability, I always thought that maybe we could become, <laughs> um, you know, fully, um, contained here on the island, but it seems like that's a long way off considering how much agricultural well, land we'd need. Yeah, the, the, you know, the vegetarian, you know, stop eating meat and that that reduces your footprint dramatically. But the just the simple amount of agricultural land as it is, 
is uh, probably inadequate for the present size of the population. Uh, we turn the football fields and soccer fields, maybe, you know, get a bit more. I mean, it's just, we, we think the little things that we see are making big impacts. And in fact, they're, they're really not. Most of those trucks coming off the ferry come over with stuff and then they go back over to the mainland with money. That's right. sort of the way it works. Ah, so uh, other exemplars of other island populations that are more sustainable, any sense of how we might compare? Um, there's a there's a whole bunch of scholarship on islands that really intrigued me, and I've only just started poking around. For example, islands tend to be safer places. Island states tend to be safer than continental places. Um, uh, I think they, island states tend to have better governments, governance. They uh, spend less on defense and more on, on people. Um, the, um, if we look right now, places that are handling the pandemic seems to be places like Iceland, New Zealand, Ireland. Um, you know, the islands, islands have something going for them. And uh, and I, I'm I'm going to I'm becoming more and more interested in that. Philip Vanini uh, uh, up on Gabriola has been involved with a with a conference and groups on on islands. Yeah, not the UK. Leslie says yes. Not all islands, Leslie. Yeah, they can make mistakes too. I, I started looking at, but I didn't finish looking at ecological footprints of island nations uh, compared to. Um, larger continental nations. So here's a, Charles has a comment about uh, various island initiatives that connect islands around the world. I know for one for renewable energy in islands. So you see any evidence Vancouver Island is connected into any of these larger global initiatives that connect islands? No, I haven't, Charles. And and that surprised it, it surprised me that um, that I didn't see any. That is because we don't have a Vancouver Island. There's no Vancouver Island politically. I don't know who would be connected into these other uh, island, other global initiatives. But maybe you could send me some stuff about it. I know that um, the the mayors in Saanich and um, and Victoria were interested in looking at this question of island ness and how do we do uh, sustainable. Um, decision make sustainable appropriate sustainable decisions on an island with such a fractured political geography yeah right moira that yeah it, it shocks everyone when you find out that in this little pokey area that all all of which has or almost all of which has victoria as a postal address we have what 12 or 14 mayors yeah it makes it very difficult Well, unless I'll give people a few moments, they might be somebody might be typing questions, but um, oh. <laughs> or emojis. <laughs> um, but thank you so much again for this, and thank you to everybody who made the time to to come. It's nice to be able to do these um, and to hear from people. There's something from Carolyn. Oh. We'll see, Carolyn. Um... Uh, what do we put in place to measure our progress along the way? Um, and, and thank you, Charles, for, for, the, for those links. I'll use them. What do we put? So I think that the first part is that we, we, need, to, we need to find our uh, political voice through leaders. And I would guess it's going to be mayors who are going to be the leaders in trying to create some political vehicle that... Um, that will begin to bring us together into um, into a, a, a regional polity and an island polity that can make decisions that are necessary at the scale at which they're um, they're they're important. Um, I'm you know I, I've talked with with friends in government and they're very clear that they don't you know they don't want to see Vancouver Island as as a different place as an as a island place. Uh, different from any other regional district in the province. Regional districts, in the province. There's no other scale. I mean, it's the province and its regional districts, and those are the scales. And um, and I think that we could learn something. And you know, I'll continue to try to work with politicians 
um, we'll find we'll make progress when we can find a way to address the problems that are in front of us at the scale that's appropriate. Future energy plans to expand distribution to the island. Not sure what you mean, Deb. You can come on and you can you're unmuted so you can speak. Oh hi. Yeah, it really makes you think, doesn't it? But i I think I've read that, you know, Ford is and uh, I mean they are I think looking at um, other, what do you want to call it, branches, connections to the island, because we are quite vulnerable, right? Yeah, yeah, we have one. So um, that one connection. You know, so then the question of whether, um, you know, whether we, whether moving towards more fossil fuel, um, you know, uh, futures is what we want. Uh, there's also been people looking at these deep sea frozen forms of methane which would be you know deep sea mining uh, of frozen methane which yeah, um, would I also be that. kind of kind of goofy on the other hand you know charles kruskoff and i have a graduate student um who's finishing up a master's thesis on tidal the potential for for tidal power on vancouver island there's a a new um, wind windmill farm up on, at cape scott um the souk first nations with their uh with their fabulous uh, uh, solar arrays you know the mm -hmm. the making the transition on vancouver island should be something that we pretty actively address uh, we're not in a the most sunny place we're not like southern alberta but as uh as a uh, hannah a grad student points out we know exactly when the tide is going to come in and go out so we you know energy issues on the island should be dealt with locally but also as an integrated uh, regional regional uh, area of uh, um, Vancouver Island. And Maria, yeah, I think Maria writes on, on an island we are more vulnerable than we think. And I, I think that that's true. Um, and we don't, she says, we don't often act until we feel vulnerable or at risk. So I, I agree. I think that what I, what happened with this, with all this came to me was I was involved with, I'll tell you the truth now, I was involved with a, a group of people who asked me to help them think out a 50-year vision for Vancouver Island. And the first thing I did was I thought, a 50-year vision, like I've got a supercomputer in my pocket. And 50 years ago, couldn't even imagine that. So the time frame was too long. And then I thought visions, well, visions are easy. You go downtown, you buy a little LSD and you have a vision. But visions by themselves aren't useful unless you have a, a vehicle for making them real. And what I realized the, the mistake was thinking about a sustainability vision for Vancouver Island. And I realized they're really we're with these, all these fractured, all these fractured um, uh, political bodies, the only real important boundary in these fractured boundaries of municipal governments, first nations and regional districts, really are all subsumed by what I called the blue boundary. And that's what I began calling this thing was the blue boundary project. And when we see ourselves as being having a blue boundary, much like David Suzuki talks about the blue marble that I have in, on the screen here in front, then we can begin to try to reduce that sense of fragility by just being more aware that of where we are and what we can do to live within our means more so, not entirely, but more so on Vancouver Island. Yeah, and Pedro, your comment about surprise when there was a boundary, the, you know, the Malahat. Well, I could tell you one of the big boundaries that I'm aware of is when I ride out from James Bay to the West Shore, people tell me, you go all the way out, out to there, out to Colwood? To me, it's a, it's a bigger distance psychologically between James Bay and Colwood than it is physically. And we have these psychological barriers all over the island, I think. Um, and, and, and Charles is coming about uh, Kauai. Kauai. Uh, yeah, Hawaii is making a big, big move to, uh, to batteries and renewables, uh, absolutely. Well, you know, if you have any ideas, friends, uh, colleagues, um, you know, drop me an email. I'm really happy to uh, to learn. Um, Charles, I'll, we'll talk more about this. Maybe you can get involved with me on this. Uh, I really appreciate all of you showing up. It's very, very kind. Uh, I'll see you on campus. Okay, thank you, Rick.